So what we're gonna talk about today is called Lagrange's Airbound. And honestly, this is some pretty zesty stuff, not because it's a difficult concept, but because the notation is a little bit scary at first. So I'm gonna need you to make a commitment to stick with me through this. So there was a dude, his name was Lagrange, and he came up with something called a Lagrange error bound and Lagrange's form of the remainder. Um, you might also see it referred to Taylor's theorem remainder in other textbooks. So let's just say, to just build some context here, that we're gonna let f of x be some power series, okay? Some terminology I wanna start with is we're going to let a partial sum be the sum of the first few terms of the series. So basically we're just not gonna finish the infinite sum. I'm gonna to refer to the tail of the series as the rest of the terms of the series after that partial sum. Lastly, we're gonna say that the remainder is what results when you add all the terms in the tail, okay? So if we wanna think about it like this, if we have first term, second term, third term, fourth term, so on and so forth. Let's say we're only going to use the first three terms. This is our partial sum. And what's left here in the remainder The tail is the remainder, okay? So for context, we have sum plus remainder. Now, error is the error that we make by assuming that f of x is the partial sum. Now, obviously, if we stop at three terms, we don't have all the terms. So error is what's left over. So we're gonna hear me refer to error as the same number as the remainder. Now that's an obvious thing, but also kind of subtle. So basically when I say error, I mean remainder, okay? That means that an error bound is a number known to be greater than the absolute value of the remainder, meaning that that is the biggest that the error could be. Now there are a couple of different types of error bounds that we've learned, number one, we've actually learned the alternating series error bound. Okay, so we already know this. And that says that it's going to be the absolute value of the first term of the tail. So remember that the error is less than the first term of the tail. We've also learned in the integral test that the improper integral is the error bound. So the integral from n to infinity of what's left over. There is a third type of error bound that's not for integral test and not for alternating series called the Lagrange remainder. Now, this French dude Lagrange is credited for showing this error. The Lagrange remainder or error is exactly equal to the first term of the tail, but with its derivative evaluated not at x equals c, but at some number which we're gonna call z. And that z happens to be between c and the value of x. As this value of z comes from repeated application of the mean value theorem, there is often no way of knowing exactly what z equals, but if you can find a number that is the uppermost bound, in fact, ooh man, highlight those words, upper bound for the derivative, then you can find a Lagrange error bound. Now, if you were like me the first time that I read that, I was like, um, I have no idea what she just said, okay? So let's consider the following. According to Taylor's theorem, here is a 
Taylor series centered at C. And this is not anything new. This is a formula you already know. Okay. Now pretend just like we did before. Let's let this be our partial sum. And this will be our remainder. Okay. The remainder is going to have the following formula. R sub n of x is equal to f n plus 1, which means the next derivative. You might want to write that down. Next derivative. But we're going to evaluate it at some spot, which we're going to call z. Don't let that freak you out. So it's not evaluated at the center. Not evaluated at the the center. And basically what this does for us is it says that the remainder is going to be less than or equal to this thing right there. Okay. When we say max of f to the n plus one derivative of z, that is going to be the maximum value evaluated at some value of z that happens to be between x and c. And what that does is it gives us a bound for error. Now what it does not do is it does not give us the exact value of the error. This bound is called Lagrange's form of the remainder or the Lagrange error bound. Okay. Some notes before we actually dive a little bit deeper into this, okay? Number one, I want you to be very clear that we are not evaluating at the center, but we plan for the worst case scenario and find the max value possible of the next derivative. Okay? Now some notation. Okay? Some notation. You're going to see a lot of different notation for Lagrange error bound. And I want to make this as simple as I possibly can for you. So let's talk about some things. First off, if you see something like this, this is just meant to be error. When we say P of 1 fourth, this is basically saying the polynomial approximation. And this is the actual. And this would be the bound, okay? You might also see some crazy stuff that looks like this. Honestly, my preference is not for you to write it like this, but the grading, er the grading showed this kind of crazy looking notation, okay? So where are we gonna go with this and what are we going to do? I think the biggest thing is to actually know what is the formula that we're even working with and so out to the side, I just want to kind of make this really, really clear about what is our formula. I want you to know that the remainder or error of r sub n of x is always going to be less than or equal to f n plus 1 derivative evaluated at some z x minus c to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. So basically, this looks exactly like the next term in a Taylor polynomial, but it's not evaluated at the center. The only difference is, is this z right here. So what is a problem going to look like? Let's work through some. So here we've got some function values. I have f of 2. I have f prime of 2. I have f double prime of 2. f triple prime of 2. Part A, 
write a third degree Taylor polynomial about x equals 2, so that's our center, and we want to use it to approximate f of 2.3. Well, I can do that. So we're going to write a third degree Taylor polynomial. According to my Taylor polynomial formula, I need f of 2. I need f prime of 2 times x minus 2. I need f double prime of 2 times x minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. And then I need f triple prime of 2 times x minus 2 cubed over 3 factorial. Remember, third degree is not the same thing as third three terms. Third degree is not the same thing as three terms. Those are completely different. Third degree means that your highest power must be three. Now, that's part, the first piece of that. I now need to use this to approximate f of 2.3 because this is an approximation. We're going to do some approximation symbols. It can be approximated by t sub 3 of 2.3. And now we're going to plug in 6 plus 4 times 2.3 minus 2 plus negative 7 over 2 factorial, 2.3 minus 2 squared, 8 over 3 factorial, 2.3 minus 2 cubed. And I want you to go plug that in your calculator. So go ahead and do that. A little bit of fun math. I think we get 6.921, always three decimal places. Now here's where things get fun. The fourth derivative satisfies the inequality such that the fourth derivative is always going to be less than nine. That is probably the single most important piece of this problem. On the closed interval from two to 2.3, use this information to find a bound for the error, notice they didn't say Lagrange error bound, but it is a Lagrange error bound problem in your approximation found in part A. So let's start with our formula. The remainder of this is going to be less than or equal to f n plus 1 of z x minus c to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. So since this is a third degree polynomial, we're going to use our sub 3 of x, okay, is going to be less than or equal to, and actually let's not put an x right there, let's put a 2.3 right there, okay. Absolute value Since this is 3, this number needs to be 4. Next term of z, x minus, since this thing is centered at 2, so 2. And then the next thing, this is also going to be 4, since this is also n plus 1. Since the denominator is n plus 1, I'm going to be dividing by 4 factorial. Close. Now here's the problem. You don't know what f to the fourth of z is, this part right here. Okay? And I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to take this 2.3 out. We'll plug in 2.3 in a minute. Okay, put an x there. Sorry about that. So what about this? This right here needs to be the biggest it possibly can be. If I go back to the problem stem, the problem stem that says that that value is never going to be bigger than 9. So we're going to use a 9 right there. Now what I'd like for you to do is plug in 2.3 for x. So we're going to go 2.3 minus 2 to the fourth power over 4 factorial. We're going to clean this up 
ever so slightly. It's going to be 9. This is going to give us 0.3 to the fourth power over 4 factorial. That number should give us 0 0.003. And so what that means is the remainder for a third degree Taylor approximation evaluated at 2.3 is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.003 by Lagrange error bound. Now, a good follow-up question to something like this would say, use your answers from part A and B to find an interval such that f of 2.3 is between A and B. Guys, if we go back up to our original part A answer of 6.921, we know that f of 2.3 was approximately 6.921. If my Lagrange error bound is 0 0.003, if I add plus or minus 6.921, if I take 0 0.003 and I add and subtract to it, that means that f of 2.3 can be no bigger than 6.924 and no smaller than than 6.918, because that's the biggest the error is. And then they might ask you, could f of 2.3 be 6.922? Well, could it be 6.922? Yes, why? Since 6.922 is in the interval 6.918, to 6.924, it's within the error bound. Could f of 2.3 equal 6.927? No, because 6.927 is not, and here I'm gonna use some math notation, is not contained in the interval 6.918 and 6.924. So basically what we did is we found an approximation, we found the biggest the error could be, and then we determined a threshold for that approximation in both directions, okay? So let's do it again. Here's another very, very similar sort of FRQ-based problem. We're gonna let our function this time be sine of 5x plus pi thirds. Now, what's kind of weird about this is that this thing is currently centered at negative pi over three. And then something interesting happens. I want you to center this at zero. So there's a problem, okay? We're gonna have to build this because the shifts do not match. Now, if this thing was supposed to be centered at negative pi over 3, man, I could have done this all day every day. So we're going to actually build a third degree Taylor polynomial by hand. So if f of x is sine of 5x plus pi thirds, let's take the derivative. It's going to be cosine of 5x plus pi thirds times a factor of five. We need a second derivative. We're going to have negative 25 sine of 5x plus pi thirds. And we need a third derivative and that should be it since we're going third degree. Negative 125 cosine of 5x plus pi thirds. Now remember that when we build a Taylor polynomial, we also need to evaluate this at the place that we want it evaluated. So if I plug in zero, we get sine of pi thirds. Well, that's root three over two. If I plug in zero into cosine, I get cosine of pi 
um, over three times five. So that should be one half times five or five halves. The second derivative evaluated at zero should be negative 25 root three over two. And then our third derivative evaluated at zero is gonna give me negative 125 over two. So what that means is my function f of x, which is sine of five x plus pi thirds is now gonna be approximated by the function f of zero, f prime of zero times x minus zero, f double prime of zero times x minus zero squared over two factorial, don't forget that two factorial, and f triple prime of zero times x minus zero to the third power over three factorial, and we're stopping there, okay? That's all they asked you to do for part three, or part A. Now in part B, they did actually use the words Lagrange error bound. You could also see just this, which is basically saying actual minus approximation. So what is this asking you to do, okay? All this is telling you to do is find the error when x is equal to 1 15th. I can tell that because there's a 1 15th where x would be, okay? And I want that error to be less than 1 12 hundredth. So let's start with our formula. The remainder, sub n of x, is gonna be bounded by the absolute value of the next derivative evaluated at some z, x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial, okay? Since this is a third degree Taylor polynomial, we're going to put a three right here. Since we are using 1 15th as our x value, we're gonna put a 1 15th right there, okay? Since three is right here, these are going to be fours. So this will be f fourth derivative evaluated at some z, x to the fourth and four factorial, okay? Now, we need a bound for the fourth derivative. So here's where things get fun. You don't have any information to figure out the largest that this can be. I need to know the maximum value of the fourth derivative. Well, let's use information that we have, okay? If the third derivative from up above was negative 125, cosine of 5x plus pi thirds, that means that my fourth derivative is gonna be positive 625 sine of 5x plus pi thirds. Now what's interesting about this is I want you to think about sine as a function, okay? Sine as a function. This sine function has been shifted to the left pi thirds and has had a horizontal compression of a fifth. So that hasn't affected the amplitude. When we talk about what is the biggest this value can be, we're talking about y values. So this number right here is always going to be less than or equal to one as its maximum. It's gonna be a number between negative one and one and one is the biggest it's gonna be which means when I multiply this by 625, the biggest that this could possibly be ever is for it to have an amplitude of 625. If you don't believe me, graph it, okay? So that means that on this interval of interest, which is zero 
to 1 15th, the biggest it's gonna be is 625. So when I talk about approximating this value, we're gonna put a 625 in for this piece. So that means that my remainder, when I use X as 1 15th, it's gonna be less than 625. Here's where we're gonna throw in that 1 15th to the fourth power over four factorial, okay? Now, math time. What if you didn't have a calculator? Ooh, yikes, okay? You will for a question like this, but you might not. I might would leave it like this if I didn't have a calculator. But what would we do, okay? Well, we know that 625 is five to the fourth, so we're gonna do something kind of interesting. I'm gonna rewrite this as five to the fourth, okay? times one over 15 to the fourth, and then four factorial is 24. That means five to the fourth, 625, 15 to the fourth. I can say that's one over 81 times 24 if we kind of reduce those a little bit, which is in fact less than one twelve hundredth. Why do I care about that? Because that's what they asked me to show in the first place. How do I know this? By Lagrange error bound. Now this is heavy stuff, not heavy stuff because of the computation. It's heavy, honestly, because of notation. So I wanna also spin backwards just a little bit and look at alternating series remainder one time. Since it's been a little bit, let's do a refresher, okay? Remember that we can use alternating series error bound anytime that we are alternating in sign, decreasing, in magnitude, meaning regardless of positive, negative, they're getting smaller. And if we know that the limit as n approaches infinity goes to zero, we know that it converges. Now, just as a general refresher, remember that our error will be less than the absolute value of your first omitted or truncated term. So in other words, as long as we have these three conditions met, we can approximate the sum of the series by using a partial sum and our error will be bounded by the absolute value of the first term. So let's do a problem, what that's gonna look like on the AP exam. Let's say we have a Taylor series around x equals two, so that's our center. And the function f converges to f of x for all x in the interval. The nth derivative of f at x equals two is given by this function. So this is a formula for derivatives, if that's not clear. And then they also tell you that f of 2 is 1 third. So in order for me to write a second degree Taylor polynomial, we're going to need to find some derivatives. So if that's a formula for my derivatives, we know that f of 2 is 1 third. I also need to find f prime of 2, and we're going to use this formula. It says negative one. Since this is the first derivative, it's gonna be the first power over three to the first power, also known as negative one third. We need to find f double prime of two, so that means negative one to the second power since it's a second derivative over three to the second power. So now we're at positive one ninth. And we also need to find f triple prime of two which will be negative one to the third power over three to the third power or negative one twenty-seventh, okay? So we need to write our polynomial. Since it's second degree, I only need to go up to the second power. I'll explain why I found a third derivative in a minute. So I'm gonna write P sub two of X. Remember that it is F of two minus, well, it'd be plus f prime of two, x minus two, 
plus f double prime of 2, x minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. And I'm stopping there because it says second degree, okay? In part B, it says show that the second degree Taylor polynomial approximates f of 3 with an error less than 0 0.001. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to find f of 3. So f of 3 is now going to be approximated by p sub 2 of 3. So let's plug in 3. 1 third. Negative 1 third. 3 minus 2. 1 ninth. 3 minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. Cleaning this up, I've got 1 third minus 1 third. 3 minus 2 squared is going to be 1. So we've got 9 times 2 factorial, which would be 1 18th. And we're done. Okay. So what do we do with this? Well, this is going to be an alternating series. It's going to alternate. It's going to decrease in magnitude. And the limit of its terms are, in fact, going to zero. So this thing is going to converge by alternating series test. So if this is an alternating series, that means that the error is going to be less than the absolute value of the next term. Now, while we didn't write it, what would the next term have been? The next term would have been minus 1 27th x minus 2 to the third power over 3 factorial. Don't write it. Because if you write that now, your answer is no longer a second degree polynomial, but that is your next term. We wouldn't have used it in this answer, but if I now bring it down here, my error is going to be less than negative 1 27th. Let's plug in 3 for x minus 2 to the third power over 3 factorial. And then we find out that its absolute value of negative 1 over 27 times 6, which is 1, 162. And is that less than 0 0.001? Heck yes, that's less than 0 0.01 by alternating series error bound. The notation is what's hard, not the execution, okay? Let's spin back to Lagrange error bound for our last problem and show you one where you could be given a graph. So I've actually modeled one of three different types for you today. If we go back to our very first Lagrange error bound function, our very first example, I gave you a bound for the maximum next derivative, okay? In our second Lagrange error bound example, we had to find the maximum value of the derivative by thinking about the graph. The third kind that you could encounter is actually when they give you a graph and you pull the maximum value from it. So let's go through start to finish. I've got some values. F of 2 is 4. F prime of 2 is negative 1 third. F double prime of 2 is negative 1 fifth. F double, triple prime of 2 is 3 sevenths. Now, you can only use alternating series if you have an alternating series. This is not going to give us an alternating series. So for our first problem, it asks us to find a third degree Taylor polynomial centered at x equals 2. And they've given us the graph of the fourth derivative. So this is the graph of the fourth derivative, okay? So third degree Taylor polynomial, 
centered at 2. Says I need to go f of 2, f prime of 2 times x minus 2, f double prime of 2 times x minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. This is a third degree, so f triple prime of 2 times x minus 2, 3 over 3 factorial. It's a polynomial, not a series, no dot, dot, dot. It then asks us to use your answer from part A to estimate f of 2.8. I can do that. All we're going to do is plug in f of 2.8. Really important. Please show its approximation. Now, if this was a non-calculator question, I would want you to literally plug in and don't do anything else. I would probably leave my answer exactly like this. Now, if you had a calculator, hot dog, go get the answer. If you don't have a calculator, you better leave your answer like this and not spend time trying to figure that out, okay? Now, because I have a calculator, we're gonna go ahead and say this is 3.706, easy cheesy. Now for part C, this is our Lagrange question. It says, use your answer and information from the graph to show f of 2.8 minus p of 2.8 is less than 1 8th. They never said the words Lagrange, but this is a Lagrange error bound question. How do I know that? Because this is a symbol for error. They want me to show that it is less than 1 8th. It's not an alternating series, so we're using Lagrange error bound. Start with your formula. Absolute value, r sub n of x is gonna be less than or equal to f, excuse me, n plus one of z x minus c to the n plus one power over n plus one factorial. More times you write it, easier it's gonna be. So my remainder, since this is a third degree polynomial, is going to be a three right here. Since I used for 2.8, 2.8 goes in for x. This is going to be the fourth derivative evaluated at some z value we don't know. My x is 2.8, my center is two. Since this is a three, everywhere I have an n plus one is going to be a four. And now we have to consider what is the biggest this value actually gets. Here's where the graph comes in. This is the graph of the fourth derivative. What's the biggest the graph of this fourth derivative gets? Seven. And so on this interval, the biggest it gets is seven. So we're gonna use seven. And we're pulling that from the graph. So now I can say that this is equal to seven point eight right here to the fourth power over 4 factorial. That happens to give me a value of 0.119. You want to always show, if they ask you to show that it is less than 1 8th, you're gonna write is less than 1 8th, and then you're gonna finish it with, by Lagrange, error bound. Done.